Okay, you are welcome along to the Huddle Breakdown. We have a different show for you today. Uh, joining me is always, or usually always, is uh, Alan Morrison from Celtic by Numbers. Um, I'm James Daly, or Juco James on Twitter, and we are joined by a secret weapon today, uh, Mr. Dominic Wells, who's our Leicester City expert. And it's going to give us all of the dirt, the good, the bad, and the ugly from the Brendan Rogers years and tenure uh, down south, as they'll say. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Dom, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me as well. And that's a lovely intro, secret weapon. I feel I feel powerful going into today, so that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> You're quite welcome. Uh, so before we really dive into the, the Rogers topic and his tenure at Leicester. Can you give a little bit of background on uh, who you are and where you're coming out? Are, are you a fellow uh, spreadsheet shagger like Alan and myself or what's kind of your background? Yeah, I've never heard it referred to as that, but I absolutely am one of those. Um, yeah, my background started, I did a degree in journalism, uh, sports-based journalism. And alongside that, I got some really good like writing opportunities in the industry. My focus has always been on Leicester City. It's the club I've supported my entire life. And then when I finished my degree, I started doing a master's in performance analysis, trying to kind of shift from being writing focused in a more data driven approach and kind of have that statistical underlining of what I'm talking about. And alongside that, I've got some really good opportunities. So I'm currently the head of performance analysis, at a really high performing college uh, academy team in the local area to Leicester uh, in Market Harbour. And alongside that, I've had some really good opportunities writing on Twitter and stuff. And so I've become kind of the, I wouldn't say the go-to person, but I, I do quite a lot of the tactical stuff for, for Leicester City. And I do a little bit here and there for the BBC as well, talking about kind of what's working, what's not been working. And in recent times, I think it's more the latter, unfortunately. Not trying to say that's down to Brendan Rogers. I've got some positives to talk about him. I don't worry about that. But um, but yeah, that's kind of, kind of the background that I'm coming from, really. And Dominic, where can people find you uh, uh, on on the you know, sort of online world in terms of any blogs or podcasts or Twitter, etc.? Yeah, so most of my work is done through Twitter. The, the handle is Dominic Wells underscore SJ. The SJ referring to sports journalist, but I have now kind of more transitioned into a data sort of performance analysis role. But that's kind of the the reason behind that tag, and that's where most of my work is completed is through Twitter. Since I've got work in the industry, working for this college near me, I've not been able to put as much time into the, the stuff online. Looking to maybe transition back to a bit more of that as the new season comes around, because as much as it's been quite difficult being a Leicester City fan recently, there's quite an exciting over the horizon coming up next year about a, a whole fresh rebuild and stuff like that. So hopeful I can get some more work out. But yeah, mainly through Twitter at uh, Dominic Wells underscore SJ. Excellent. Thank you. And it's because I, mean, I guess I guess it's probably... You know, it's almost the, the end of that cycle that started with the, the the title, of course, and then that team's kind of got older, and and you've gone through the Rogers era, and you're with a lot of success. So we'll get into all of, all of that, uh, Dominic. So I don't know whether uh, James, just to kick off, should we should we start should we start at the end, and and should we talk about the the nasty stuff first, and you know ha, ha, where did it go wrong? <laughs> where did it all go wrong, Dominic? <laughs> well, I mean that, that would stay with our brand as far as being internal optimists. So uh, yeah. yeah, let <laughs> let let may, maybe start there as far as to provide some uh, maybe thirty thousand foot context. I mean the the owners experiencing some significant financial issues with the the pandemic and them being. You know what I read. I mean, obviously a conglomerate, but um, huge ownership in malls, which you know, not the greatest place to be in commercial real estate relative to uh, a place where people don't want to be in public. So, um, how, let's start there. How, how much do you think that the issues that emerged, particularly in the last eighteen months, were uh, driven by financial constraints? I think a lot could be attested to that. I think. We talked there, you speak about kind of the start of the end was Leicester City winning the Premier League. And in a kind of backwards way, it was because we achieved that success. And so we kind of wanted to build on that. But we didn't have the infrastructure. We we're a 5,000 to one underdog story. So the infrastructure wasn't there to be competing for European football. And so we tried to piggyback off that title winning season by investing in around the club as well as on the pitch, the players. And that was the idea was to get European football inside of that. We had that one season in the Champions League when we won the, the Premier League. But... We got so close the following few seasons, we finished fifth place both times, spent the majority of both of those seasons in the top four. And I think the goal for the club was to establish ourselves as this kind of outside European entity. And so we were putting so much 
into our infrastructure around the club. We built one of the best training ground facilities in all of Europe that cost 100 million. And then we're doing all of this sort of investing at a time then where COVID comes out of nowhere. And I don't think the fans or even the, the owners could have ever foreseen something like that. And you've alluded to it there really quite nicely. They're a duty-free company, so it's tourism-based King Power. And when the whole world gets put into a lockdown, there's not a whole lot of financial revenue coming through through that industry. And so it massively, massively influenced them. And so you try and keep yourself afloat as a Premier League team, pushing for European football. But if you make a couple of wrong decisions in that process, if you recruit maybe the wrong players and you put stock into players that haven't got the value that you kind of wanted to get from them or what you'd expected from them, it can be kind of a downhill spiral. And I think it's just kind of came at the wrong time for us. We're looking to expand the stadium. This was prior to us getting relegated. So whether or not they kind of stall on that expansion, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful they still do because I think that there's every reason for La City to bounce back next season, but I don't want to get too much into that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, we, we invested at probably the worst time possible. We, we tried to be this underdog story and it came at just a, a really bad time financially. And we can't compete with the, the elite teams up there. And I think trying to do so in, in a model that we tried to stick to, kind of like the Brighton-Brentford model, which is go for those data picks, go for players that have got a low value that you can grow and then sell on and then go for something like that. But in the background, we didn't want to sell our best assets. Our model was to sell a big player and invest that money into the team again. But you were always losing quality by doing so. And so you're never really gaining on that elite team, the top four. So we tried to hold on to our best assets. And all these decisions came to the, to the foreground in, in 2020 when COVID started. And it just was like this recipe for disaster, basically. And then in the last season, there was quite a few poor decision making tactically and on the pitch and stuff like that that's kind of led to us being in the place that we're in. And... You know, I think the sentiment just from the entire club is like, how has this happened? All the players spoke about it after the season when they put their message to the fans and said, we're really sorry. The kind of general consensus is like, we don't know how we were here. And that's from the players, the ones that should be taking accountability for their actions. Even they couldn't really muster up an answer as to why this has happened. We're, in recent history, one of the best, in quote, quotation marks there, sides to have gone down from the Premier League. You look at some of the quality in that squad, they should be no way near kind of competing in the in the relegation battle. And so it's a massive, massive underperformance. And I do think that you can attribute quite a lot of that to the to the failing financials. We were kind of put into a situation where we tried to hold on to our elite talent, tried to invest here and there, but we just couldn't because we didn't have the money to back it. And unfortunately, that was kind of the start of the real demise. I think, I don't know if you guys would have seen about this, but we played a game against Nottingham Forest last se the season before last in the Cup. And Rogers came out with quite an explosive interview saying we need an overhaul of the entire squad. We need so many of these players to move on. And he had been given that kind of general idea that the, the club could do that. And then as summertime rolled around, we couldn't make any signings. We sold our best player in Wesley Fofana towards the end of the season. Could never really reinvest that money because of the, the way that Chelsea had structured their deals in recent times with the amortisation. And so that money never really came through. And we signed Wout well Fast for 15 million, but we'd sold Fofana for the region of 75 to 80 when the whole package deal gets put together. And so it was this idea that we just weren't really competing on all grounds and Rogers didn't get that rebuild he wanted, just kind of really got the ball rolling and, and snowballed out of control. And, and that's kind of, in a real small way, how we've got to the situation we're at at the moment. That's great, great summary. Thank you. Um, so, you know, obviously we've already been on this rodeo with Rogers once. So some of that echoes a little bit. I think that circumstances sound quite different um, as far as the the drivers as to why maybe some of the sales didn't occur. Um, mm -hmm. But so let, let's break that down, the recru rec recruitment down into kind of three, I have a three part question. The, the one is, um, you know, just as an outsider, uh, you know, being, you know, an analytics focused fan um, is, you know, Lester has had a good reputation as far as building that infrastructure, as you say, some actually industry leading talent in building that data and analytics um, aspect of the club. So the first part of the question is, how much do you think Rogers was embracing that and deploying it? Did it seem coherent? Like, it could, because you're grounded in that world, did, did it look like those efforts were manifesting in actual signings? Um, and then the second part of that, what was the quality of the signings? And then I think you've already kind of answered, which is, you know, and this has been a big Celtic issue. One of my big criticism is um, not as coherent on when to sell, who to sell and when, you know, kind of peak market, contract, age profile. So if you could kind of roll through those three components. Yeah, absolutely. So 
the first part of that is kind of how much input did Rogers have on, on recruitment or how much was he kind of involved in that process? Obviously, as an outsider looking in, I can only speculate, but I feel like I have a decent understanding of kind of how things went. And Leicester City, for the for a number of years, and it predates Rogers coming into the club, have had a really good business model in terms of how we recruit players. You know, we've got great examples of Angolo Kante, Jamie Vardy, these players that we try and sign for low value. We have Morris fits into this model as well. Players that we've all bought individually for less than four or five million. Each player's cost is that amount. And the idea is to then progress them. And then you, you're aware that at Leicester City, it's a little bit, of, I refer to as a stepping stone club. We know that there's other teams that these players want to go and strive and play for. We can't offer European football on a consistent basis. So you have to have that in the back of your mind when you're signing these players, that when they reach that that peak level in terms of market value and quality, you're probably going to end up losing them to some of the, the top teams around the world. And we were really good at following that model and having a lot of success with it. It started to derail a little bit when we won the Premier League. We needed players to be able to compete in European football. We didn't have a squad big enough to compete. And so we started going after players that were a bit more ready to go straight in Europe. And that in, involved signing players like Islam Slimani, Adrian Silva. So these players were completely against the business model of signing young, grow them and sell them on. These were much more established players with a much bigger fee attached to them when we signed them. And they did not work at all. And so after that, we said, no, let's go back to what's been working. Let's go back again to that sign young it's low risk, high reward. If these players don't work out, you've not invested a whole lot of money in them. But for the most part, it seems to work quite nicely. Where I would say Rogers came into all this equation is that he went against the Leicester City model big in a big way for one of the seasons. So it came just after we beat Southampton 9-0, which is probably one of Rogers' most high profile games for Leicester City as a manager. It's an unbelievably good performance. And the following season, we signed two out of their four defenders two of the back four we signed after beating them 9-0. We went out and offered crazy contracts to Yannick Vestergaard and Ryan Bertrand, who not only don't fit into the model of signing Young, we also offered them massive, massive contracts. Both players are rumoured to be on £78,000 a week. Bertrand's deal has now expired, but Vestergaard is still with the club. He could be one that had his contracts kind of halved by going down to the Championship. Quite a lot of players have that clause in their contracts, but at the time were signed for £78,000 a week and a decent amount in terms of an upfront cost as a transfer. And those signings seemed really weird from the outside. Not many fans understood why we targeted those kind of players. And it has now since come out that Rogers had really asked for us to go out and sign those players. He really, really wanted them. And I'm not sure why he, he had some interest in Bertrand. They worked together at Chelsea and he'd some, been an admirer of Vestergaard for a few years prior. And I think Vestergaard is a profile that is interesting. If you fit him into the right system, it can be really beneficial. But he's very slow. But he's a great passer. He's a technical centre-back, which I think Rogers wants. He likes to build out from the back and you guys will know all about that sort of stuff. And I think if you can put the right players around Vestergaard, I think it's a good signing. But we just didn't have the players around him. And we wanted to play a high defensive line. There's so many things that just didn't quite make sense of why we'd gone after the, the Danish international. And they're kind of the most high-profile cases of where it's been accredited to Rogers' input on the transfer market. But to flip that and put a positive spin on things, we had a really good signing window where we signed some players that haven't quite truly reached their potential in Bubakari Samare and Pat Sandaka. And Bubakari Samare, when he signed, accredited his reason to joining was because Brendan Rodgers was manager. He knew that he had had success with youth in the past. He'd progressed players. He developed them into a good standard. And so Samare was interested to be working under Rodgers' management and under his coaching and to develop as an individual. Now, I'm a massive su supporter of Samare. The fan base, the Leicester City fan base is kind of split on their opinion of him, whether or not he's been a success since he's joined and ultimately he's been part of a relegated side, so probably hasn't really reached the potential we wanted him to. But the fact that he cited Brendan Rodgers being one of the key reasons he joined the club was because he's got that kind of know-how in terms of developing youth players and, and the players knew that meant that he was able to attract players that maybe Leicester City couldn't have gotten and signed because he just won Liga the season before with Lille. So he was quite hot property and we were able to attract him to, to the King Power Stadium. So as much as I think that a lot of fans will say that Rogers really shouldn't have got involved in the recruitment side of things. The, the signings of those two Southampton players made little to no sense. And I think for the most part, because of, and, and again, this predates Leicester City, but I think Rogers' career has been pretty good in terms of developing youth players. The odd model matched what he wants to do as a coach. And so I think he probably was a massive supporter of it. There's just two high profile cases where he's like, I really want you to sign these two players. Let's go against the model. And they just really didn't work out for us. And so I think that it's harsh to be too critical of Rogers on that, but I do think that they are two that really stick with Leicester fans and they're kind of ones where we say he really got it wrong there. And 
I think that can annoy and frustrate quite a lot of the fans because our model has been so successful over the years. So you mentioned a couple of those, Dom, a couple of aspects there of Rogers' play. You talked about playing out from the back. You talked about a higher line. I mean, that resonates very much with the manager, Ange Postacoglu, that we've just had, and also with you know, Rogers himself when he was at Celtic. Uh, some, of, some of the background reading I've done on Leicester over the last few years under Rogers was I was he seemed to often play three at the back or five at the back and against the bigger teams, uh, maybe more of a counter-attacking style. So I guess what I wanted to lead on to really was a question to you about over his tenure, how did you see his tactical approach develop and change, improve or get worse or whatever? Um, and, 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 and leading on to that, you know, did he have a different approach for when they played, for example, a tough European game away or, you know, Man United away or Liverpool, you know, tough EPL top six game away, was there a difference or did he develop a style that to, to counter other teams in his tenure? Yeah, so the, the usage of formations was an interesting one. I do think that Rodgers will always favour a 4-2-3-1, 4-3-3 formation. His time when he drifted and changed to a back three, back five was mainly due to injuries in key areas that really forced his hand there. Leicester City have not been blessed with having many wingers. And so when we pick up an injury to one of our wingers, you then only have one to play. And so for the most part this season, we've been playing James Madison as a, as a false winger, basically, who kind of drifts into play as a number 10, but starts the game as a right winger. And so to kind of combat that issue of only having Harvey Barnes as an out-and-out -out winger, he changed to a back three system, which then can you can play with wingbacks. And on the other side, we're quite blessed in terms of having quite a lot of good attacking fullbacks. So it kind of matched that and it worked well for him. In terms of de development throughout his time at the club, I think he tried quite a lot of interesting ideas and, and to, to good success for the most part as well. You know, towards the latter part of his tenure, he started using some inverted fullbacks um, that was going into this season. So he really changed kind of the, the blueprint of how we wanted to build out from the back and change that sequence. We like to play into our centre-backs, play into our full-backs and then play into a double pivot, play so wide and then inside and then try and progress through that way. But that was coming quite predictable for us and we were struggling to find the full-backs. The wingers of the opposition would pin us quite high and it made it difficult. And so to kind of combat that, we inverted the full-back, kind of packed the midfield and gave us more options centrally. And another kind of caveat to that as well is that we had Yuri Tillemans who would drop in and play as a right-back when we did that. So there was this kind of complementary movement where he... His, his profile is he wasn't overly mobile. So if you can put him at right back, he doesn't have to do the tracking of a midfielder, essentially. And so he could then play that quarterback role. There's been so many high profile cases in the Premier League of Reese James, Trent Alexander-Arnold, João Cancelo, who have found so much success from creating chances from right back. And so we tried to manufacture that by having Tillemans drop in at right back and, and move our full backs inside. But as kind of goes along the whole tenure for Rodgers, injuries were massively influential in terms of changing the inverted fullbacks. We wanted to use two players, specifically James Justin and Ricardo Pereira, who then both got long-term injuries just as the season started. And so he must have been looking at his tactic sheet and just having to rip it all up because they spent all the pre-season working on this style and then it was just never going to be used because he didn't have the right profile of players because injuries came in. What I will say is something that I do think transcends all of his time with the club is when we play against the elite teams and when we play in Europe, there's this idea and I refer to it as a bit of an inferiority complex. So he kind of sets up knowing that the team is not as good as the opposition. And so we don't play our normal football. And that used to frustrate me a little bit because I think on our day, Leicester City can still apply that passing game, build out from the back and try and put it to teams. You've seen so many good cases of it with Brighton in recent years and other teams in the Premier League that when they actually play their style versus the elite teams, they can still find success. Rodgers didn't have that same level of confidence. And so we would often play, as you alluded to earlier, a counter-attacking system versus these top, top teams. And all that does is just relinquish control of the game, put so much pressure on yourself because you're giving them control of the pitch. They have so much territory against us because you're accepting that you're not going to see much of the ball. And all that it takes then is one mistake in your defensive third and then and they score. Whereas if you're playing your normal game, you have the ball in their half more often. You don't have that highest level of concentration where you've got to make basically zero mistakes. And I think that is one of the key issues that we struggled defensively throughout his time at the club is that he would make these decisions in game. He'd, his man management or in terms of making adjustments in the middle of the game, I found to be bizarre at times in terms of, you know, if we were if we were leading a game, for example, he would always bring on a centre-back to try and close the game out, even when it didn't make sense to against teams that are, are of a similar level or even maybe even of a lesser standard to Leicester. There was this idea of like, we need to kind of sit on what we've got and try and get a win that way rather than continuing to play the style we are that got us into that leading game state we'd kind of sacrifice it and, and try and hold on to what we had 
And he would always kind of struggle if the opposition manager made a tweak mid-game to kind of understand what that tweak was and then how to control it. And there's quite a lot of cases I can think back over where teams made an adjustment. I can think to a game against Brighton where they moved how Matoma was working against us and we just couldn't find a solution. He, he just ran havoc down that left wing and, and caused us all, all so many problems. And it's that idea of making those kind of mid-game adjustments that I think Rogers really struggled to kind of get right over the time with Leicester City. It's also really easy to say this stuff with hindsight because we were one or two points away from top four in back-to-back -back seasons. And so everyone can kind of look back at his tenure and be like, it's been not a failure because I think that is overperformance to what this club is expected to do. But had we got top four in either of those two seasons, I think his time at the club would be reflected in a much more positive light. And I'm still one of those that thinks that he did a great job for us. I don't hold any kind of hostile energy towards him like quite a lot of our fan base do, to be honest. They think that he is kind of the reason that we're getting relegated this season. As much as he was sacked with as much time that we could have done to kind of avoid the drop, a lot of people attribute the, the relegation to Rogers' management and his kind of hostility towards certain players, not including the likes of Kaglar Soyuncu, who's got a free move to Atletico Madrid, basically didn't feature for us this season. But Simeone thinks he can work in a back three, five at Atletico Madrid. It's like there's obviously a quality player in there. He's a Turkish international, won Premier League player, was inside the Premier League player of the year, I can't even speak there, Premier League team of the season in 2019-20. So he's obviously a very, very good player. And Soyuncu and, and Rogers fell out and he never got a minute basically this season. And it's those kind of weird... You could maybe talk about Rogers' personality that gets involved there and that ego side of things that maybe blocks his decision making in terms of wanting to use these kind of players. But these these issues kind of arose throughout his his three seasons. And, and I think that's kind of why there's a, there's a there's an idea in football, isn't there? There's a coaching, you kind of have three years as a manager as a cycle, and then managers tend to lose things. There's Mourinho's been high profile of it. You know, there's only a few that kind of go against that grain. And I think Rogers does fit into that kind of rule as that after a certain amount of time, either the players start to not trust what he's doing anymore or start to get frustrated at how he comes across and those sorts of things. And it just kind of derails from there, really. Mm. No, that, that, there's a lot of, there's a lot, lot in there, Don. Thank, thank you. Um, I think James, I'll let James in a second pick up with you on the injury question because that's a, a particular topic that we've done a lot of analysis on across Rogers' career is, and at Celtic and Liverpool as well. Um, but I just wanted to sort of dig into a couple of the things that you said there. So one of the things that, you know, we noticed when he was at Celtic was that in terms of in-game decisions, he leaned a lot on Chris Davis. It was normally Chris Davis that would spot things and be in his ear. Uh, and, and and actually, I felt that, that Rogers stroke Davis were actually really proactive. They used to, they used to make changes before something gathered negative momentum. And that would seem to be quite a feature. And uh, get, get your observation on that. And then the second thing is, what happened was, it seemed over his three and a bit years at Celtic, he just increasingly got more and more possession-based and almost you know, cautious with the ball, uh, almost keeping... So I don't, I don't think we ever saw him bringing on the centre-backs. I mean, it just wouldn't make any sense in the Scottish Premier League to mm -hmm. be 1-0 up home to Ross County and bring on a centre-back. So, you know, we wouldn't expect that. But he, he did... He, he almost perfected the art of defending by having the ball. It was almost like negative mm. possession a lot of the time. So again, I don't know if that's something that you saw at Leicester or whether you, maybe he's improved in that regard as, as well. Yeah, so to answer the second question there, mm. I think I think that the issue was is that he would acknowledge that we were maybe starting to lose control of the game or, or something was going right and he would try to solidify the defensive shape. And I think it's also worth mentioning that as a club, Leicester City have been quite weak defensively over the last few seasons. And, you know, do you, how much do you put on the manager in terms of not addressing that as an issue? Or how much is it down to the, the profile of players you've got in the squad? And Rodgers has spoken and gone on record many of times saying he wanted to improve the, the level of players. He wanted to go out and sign these players. But as we've already spoken about, the financial restraints kind of held him back and he couldn't make those changes he wanted to do. So I think that it's difficult... To, to put too much of it on him. One thing I will say about the Chris Davis and Rogers relationship, I think it, that definitely stayed true with Leicester City. Something I think they did really, really good is they'd have their pre-game setup would be perfect most games. I think they'd go into the fixture and get the right setup for the opposition. They'd do their, their background work, their history, and the way they'd start the game would always be really, really good. And that's why it kind of stuck out to me that when the opposition manager then makes a tweak and changes from their original game plan to what Rogers has set up to, to nullify in the gate, when they change that, we'd struggle to then kind of reclaim control of how we were doing prior to, to them making that tweak. 
And that was definitely something that was consistent throughout the time at the club. And I don't know whether or not that was because we didn't have the players that could adapt in terms of when they were asked to change what they were doing. What I will say, though, and something that Rogers kind of championed throughout his time at the club was signing players that could play multiple positions. He always wanted to get fullbacks that could play the left and right back. He always liked wingers that could play on the left and the right. And I think that idea is to be kind of adaptable in game. So if they need to make a tweak, you've got players that can play multiple different positions. And even when we sign midfielders, Bubakari Samari, for example, can play as a six and eight. And if you really needed him to, he could play as high as a 10. And it's that idea that you've got players that are creative and good enough to play multiple positions, multiple roles that allows him to make those tweaks. And maybe at the start of his time at Leicester City, he maybe felt limited in how much he could actually adjust the team when the opposition manager was making these tweaks. He felt a little bit limited and restricted. And so he was trying to build a squad that was maybe a little bit more flushed out in terms of, I've got two players on the pitch that can play different positions. Let's move it around. Let's adjust this and that and, and make it so that we can kind of nullify what the opposition's kind of tweaked. Um, I didn't put too much stock into how much of it was Davis versus Rogers. In, in all honesty, I don't know necessarily who was the figurehead in terms of that sort of stuff. And it would be interesting, actually, now you've said that, to go back in retrospect and see, was it maybe more Chris Davis or Rogers? I, I believe Chris Davis is now on the move to, is it Tottenham Hotspur, I believe, or something yeah, like Tottenham, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. Um, so he, he will be, it'll be a different set up then for Rogers at Celtic going forward. Um, but for me, I always felt like it was mainly mainly Rogers that was making those decisions, but but I could definitely be wrong. I, as I say, I wasn't putting as, as much stock in that as, as I maybe should have done. Nice. Then I'll I'll uh I'll touch on the injury topic because it is, as Alan mm. suggested, it is something that we've um talked about quite a bit and looked at. Um so this is not a new Mm -hmm. a, a, an emergent uh, property of of Rogers' tenure at at Leicester. So, um, how would you characterize that issue? Because I just on you know some basic metrics like days lost, injury, and that kind of stuff uh, from the Premier League noticed that Leicester had drifted towards the worst end of the table, shall we say? Um, is your sense that those were mostly soft tissue type injuries, like a lot of guys coming up with lame hamstrings and calves, or was it, you know, more so just bad luck with trauma, you know, people uh, g going in with nasty tackles and then out, you know, with a fractured leg for, for three months, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, it was a beautiful blend of the two, and, uh, and that's kind of why it derailed so much. But yeah, there's quite a few high-profile major, major injuries. I know that Fafana had a leg break um, in the last preseason game versus Villarreal before we went into the season. You know, you can't do anything about that. That's just a, a freakish injury. And that would happen uncharacteristically quite often. One thing that was a major, major problem for Leicester City was the new training facility. The players would train on an indoor pitch that was softer. The ground wasn't quite as hard hitting as when they played at the King Power. And so there's kind of this idea that the muscle and joints weren't necessarily being trained or, or developed in the case that when they started playing on harder ground, it would be more impactful on their legs and it was actually causing injuries. And the other thing as well that was really bizarre is there's a very famously loved medic at the club in Dave Rennie that, that Rogers just basically sacked out of nowhere. And he went and I think he joined Everton um, after leaving the club. But he'd been with us for 10, 15 years and we'd never really before that had many major injury issues in terms of it would just be those freakish injuries and then in a hamstring injury here or there that's just mainly down to the wear and tear of playing as many football matches as Premier League players do. But once we got rid of Rennie and obviously we signed a replacement and, and the players were training on that facility that had a softer turf and the players maybe weren't developing, as I said, their muscles to be the standard you need it to be, kind of seemed to create this environment where the players were just pulling up with injury very, very often. I also think that it's kind of amplified by the fact that we have quite a few players that are injury prone. Ricardo Pereira, for example, hasn't played a proper season, despite being, when he was fit, one of the best fullbacks in the league. He just can't stay fit anymore. He returns and gets injured straight away. And, and a part of that, I do attest to Rogers' management of an injury in terms of rushing him back when he wasn't quite ready. He played him in a on a frosty pitch in, uh, against Zoya Lahansk in the Europa League after he hadn't played for five, six months. It's like, that's not the environment to bring a player back. And he then was out for another three months after that. And it was also a nothing fixture for us. We didn't need to win the game. We just needed to go there, kind of put some players out and, and try and get a point or something. And we, we had fixtures at home that we could then use to progress in the Europa League. And so it seemed like a really bizarre decision. And he also started so injury in that game, who then was out for a month afterwards with an injury he picked up. So there was like a few decision-making things where I thought you've, you've rushed a player back there, but then we were quite a thin squad 
And so Rogers wanted these players back because he wanted to use them. And it, so it's it all kind of, again, as I keep alluding to it, all snowballed and spiralled. And that's why I do think that as much as it's a devastating situation that's happened for the club, and Rogers is, has take, got to take some responsibility in that process. I do think it was this recipe for disaster in terms of all these things happening at the same time. It's like you'd need to be getting a lot of decisions absolutely perfect, which is just not really sustainable. And it just kind of all happened at, at the wrong time for us. So I don't want to put too much of the injury stuff down to Rogers. I think a lot of it's down to the, the new training system that we've got. And I hope going forward, we kind of address that. And the new coach that's come in, Enzo Maresca gets the players playing outside. We've got about 25 pitches outside. So if they just used one of those, it's got a harder ground. The players could get used to it. And that that would maybe, you know, nullify what's going wrong by playing on a softer softer pitch on the inside. But I mean, you spend a hundred million pounds on training facility, you want to use it to its best. And then that's kind of what happens, I guess. So, so yeah, that's kind of a, a weird summary of how the injury side of things has gone for, for Leicester. A blend of both muscle and also freakish injuries. Well, if Alan, if you'll indulge me, I, I had two more questions then, and then I'll, I'll reload for you. Um, they're kind of unrelated. I think one will be relatively brief. But um, so w- we remember uh, one of the things that Rogers used to talk about when he was, you know, looking for player profiles at Celtic, and we kind of joke about it, you know, pace and power with a Northern Irish accent. Um, and I, when I look at, particularly in midfield, the type of players that Rogers acquired at Leicester. It certainly fit that. I mean, a very kind of athletic, fast, you know, leaning towards big and physical. Um, and that is the antithesis of our current midfield. <laughs> and that's one of my concerns. Uh, so just as someone who obviously kind of lives and breathes Lester, how, how would you characterize the athleticism um, in the squad overall? I mean, I don't, I don't know your squad that well. So whether it's at the wing back position or you, know, you characterize the center back as maybe not fitting that kind of profile, which is a little odd um, from Southampton. So h- how would you generally characterize the kind of players that Rogers w- was uh, found appealing? Yeah, I think the players Rogers went after do fit that kind of characterization of powerful uh, and, and strong players and, and willing athletic runners. I think the squad they inherited wasn't that. And so there was this idea of trying to transition it from a more possession based in terms of like the players wanted to pass and move and, and smaller, more agile, nimble players. You know, you think back to like the players that we had was like a Riyad Mahrez would be a perfect example of that. And so he had to try and maybe build these players up and go for more physical presences to, to kind of compete in the Premier League because you need to have that. It's, a, it's a, an important component. I can do all the tactical and data analysis I want, but if you don't have players that are willing to put physical fights in and have a battle, you, you're going to lose at some part of that. And I think a really interesting kind of footnote in all of this is that a player that really emerged under Rogers' tenure was Keenan Dewsbury Hall, who was a youngster. He got sent out on loan to Luton for a few seasons, came back in and became a regular starter because he just had an engine in midfield. He wasn't powerful, but he was an athletic runner and he gave us what we needed in midfield to press the ball and press high. And so we could kind of operate in this mid to high block, but when Dewsbury Hill wants to step up, it then becomes a high press. And so then we can really put on the front foot to our opposition. And that helped because alongside him was a Yuri Tillemans that isn't overly mobile. I think that he's an interesting case study because I do think Tillemans was accepting that he was going to be moving on from us for a longer period of time than when he actually stayed with us. And he's eventually now gone to Aston Villa on a free. But I think he kind of, I'll never say a player downs tools. I think they always put in 100% effort, but I don't think he was necessarily in the best physical condition that he could have been. And so he was struggling mobility-wise in midfield. So Dewsbury Hall was brought in to kind of take up his role and, and, and provide those extra legs. And then at defensive midfield, we've had a merry-go-round of players there again due to injuries but it's normally been Wilfred and Didi who is the epitome of what you've spoke about powerful athletic one of the best defensive midfielders on his day and I'm hearing reports that Rogers is maybe interested in taking him to Celtic which I think could be a great piece of acquisition because uh, he, he will move on there's also Saudi Arabian clubs that are swirling around as they are every player at the moment by the sounds of things um but yeah the the, the profile of player was definitely I think the main focus was being ambidextrous in terms of positions could play a multitude of positions seem to me to be the focus of Rogers' recruitment have players that can can do a multitude of roles and that allows him to be a bit more fluid in the setup and systems and he doesn't necessarily have to change personnel to change how he wants to attack a game of football then alongside that I do think he he it's a prerequisite isn't it for Rogers' team that they will be 
the runners that they will press, they will do those sorts of things. And so the players had to kind of buy into that, even if they weren't necessarily of that profile when he first joined. So that would be probably my, my general answer to that one. My, my other one uh, is, and this is a, a personal um, concern with Celtic, uh, has been in the past and continues to be, is the keeper position. Um, mm. And that was also something that was a bit of a, I don't want to call it a mess, but it wasn't a great <laughs> part. It, it wasn't a great part of Roger's first tenure um, as far as the coherence of style of play relative to the skill set. And then you throw in, and I think there is some relatability here relative to Leicester, um, is you know the, the golf that Celtic experience in what you need your keeper to do, what we need the keeper to do domestically, which is basically stand there and do nothing for most of the game. Uh, <laughs> and then when we go into Europe or you know the derby matches that we have, you know four to six times a season where they might actually have to you know <laughs> do something other than pass the ball. Um, so we, we fell into this kind of vortex with Rogers where we. You know, we had Craig Gordon, who at that time was still a pretty good stop, shot stopper, but not good with the ball at his feet, not good coming off the line. And then he brought in Doris DeVries to, as kind of the opposite of that. And that turned into a complete mess in Europe because he couldn't uh, he couldn't stop a, <laughs> a, a, a water balloon best. being thrown at him. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so how would you characterize his tenure? I mean, obviously, Schmeichel was a, a huge part of that, but he was an aging Schmeichel. So uh, how would you, which again, um, some we, he's going to be inheriting an aged Joe Hart as the, mm -hmm. the incumbent. So how would you characterize his time at Leicester relative to that position? Yeah, I, I think a lot of people put, Wait into Leicester City losing Schmeichel at the start of the season and kind of the, the downhill spiral that resumed after that. I don't think that's necessarily the case. So in terms of Schmeichel as a profile of goalkeeper, isn't great with his feet, is primarily a shot-stopping goalkeeper that had to learn to be able to play out from the back under Rodgers' management. That was definitely the case. And I think I'm in the minority when I say that. I feel like he took on that role pretty well, especially as he developed it towards the latter part of when he was at Leicester. I felt like... Schmeichel had enough in his arsenal to be a ball-playing goalkeeper. Never to the likes of, you know, your top-end Premier League goalkeepers and Alisson Edison, for example, but could definitely hold his own. And, you know, most of our building possession sequences would start from a short pass from Schmeichel and he'd feel comfortable to also receive it in open play. It wouldn't just be a starter of play, he'd receive it from the defence as well and he would be able to pick the right passes. There was a little bit of a trend that, and I think this has also been a case for our other goalkeepers. So it feels like a bit of a Rogers kind of tactical idea is to play this clipped pass into the fullback. So you try and beat a pressing line, you do a chipped ball into the fullback, but it just puts the fullback under so much pressure. They've got an awkward ball to control. They're getting pressed in behind from the winger and it was causing us quite a lot of issues. And I'm not going to say that's Schmeichel's fault. I'm also not going to say it's Rogers' fault, but it was just kind of interesting to see, is that a profile thing of Schmeichel or is that because it seems to have stuck with all the goalkeepers that we've used. So primarily a shot stopper, and then when he left, and he was a massively influential figure at the club, and I think his his kind of the way he left the club, and it was so sudden, and it caught the whole fan base off guard, I, I, was an interesting development. And I don't know necessarily if that's personalities colliding behind the scenes. It didn't seem to be left in a very amicably way. I think there was something that happened behind the scenes. We then put all of our stock into Danny Ward, who'd been a number two for the majority of his career, but was, in Rogers' eyes, a second number one who deserved a chance. And Ward is definitely more of a ball-playing goalkeeper than a shot-stopper. But as has shown with last season, shot-stopping is a very important attribute for a goalkeeper, and Ward was not up to the task in regards to that. And as much as his ball-playing was an inherent positive in terms of he could make those passes into midfield and was able to start, again, possession sequences could be relied upon as what I refer to as a safety net pass for a defender to pass back in, in safety. He wasn't making those right saves as a shot stopper. And, and that's kind of crucial to, to being a goalkeeper. And a lot of the Leicester City fan base were crying out for Iverson, who ended up the season being our number one goalkeeper, who'd had very successful loan spells in the championship with Preston. And he is not a ball playing goalkeeper. He is the, as traditional as it gets. Tall, claims crosses, does all that sort of stuff that I think both Ward and Schmeichel had struggled with over their time at the club. We lack that presence of a goalkeeper that will leave their six yard box, six yard box on a corner and take all the pressure from the defence. The first touch when Schmeichel and Ward are in goal will always be either a forward or a defender. It would never be the goalkeeper making that first contact in terms of a cross. And having Iverson 
was someone that was capable of doing that and could do it to a good standard. You just kind of lost that ball playing. And Rogers had a major reluctance to use Iverson, very, very sparingly used him, only gave him minutes in kind of cup competitions towards the early stages where you're playing against much inferior opposition. And again, people say, well, why were you so reluctant to change? Because it obviously wasn't working with Danny Ward. At the time when Danny Ward was removed as our number one, I think he had the worst post-shot expected goals conceded in the league. So in terms of the shots he was facing, he was making a bad deal of it. He shouldn't have conceded anywhere near the amount of goals he was conceding. Uh, and, and so that reluctance really hindered our progress. <laughs> you know, if you're conceding that many goals, how are you supposed to win games? So I think the goalkeeping merry-go-round towards this season has been a little bit interesting. Prior to that, I don't think I've ever batted an eyelid at it. Kasper Schmeichel was a fantastic servant for us and is more of the mould of a Joe Hart in terms of he's just a bit more of a traditional keeper. And I think that, I don't think that's necessarily the worst thing, but I think as you guys both know, Rogers will want someone that can maybe be a ball player in terms of start those sequences, be relied upon in open play sequences. It's if you've got that kind of profile to do that, because he, he doesn't seem to have budged from wanting a player to do that to the point where he was reluctant to use Iverson because he felt that he didn't have the capabilities to do so. And so that meant that he kept a goalkeeper in Danny Ward that was conceding way, way too many goals because he felt that was more positive to have a ball player than, than an actually good shot stopper. Okay. So thanks for that. That makes perfect sense. So a couple of topics, uh, Dom, before we wrap up then. You, you touched on a little earlier that this season, I think it was this season, you said that um, Rogers had started to look at playing more more his fullbacks more in, inverted. Um, that's something that we've seen uh, very up close over the last two years under Postacoglu. It's something that I'm, I'm sure you'll, that Tottenham fans will see. Um and, and and with some success, it has to be said. Um, it took you know it's not an easy thing to implement, and you know different players have taken to it to different uh, extre- you know to in, to, you know, to different lengths. I'd be interested in, in your observations on that. In particular, we've got a left back called Greg Taylor, who, in in all in in, in most respects, is a completely unremarkable footballer. Other than he's just got a, an absolutely fantastic attitude, you know, a willingness to learn. He'll run all day, not very fast, but he'll run all day for you. Mm-hmm. And and he just seemed to completely embrace this inverted fullback role. And he'd be popping up all over the place and making insightful passes. When Rogers was first at Celtic, of course, he had Kieran Tierney. Now, Kieran Tierney was essentially a winger that tackled occasionally. So he'd be bombing on the outside of Scott Sinclair all day long. Um, so you know, there was no inverting happening happening there. So yeah, so 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 for, so for number one, just your observations, a bit t- deeper dive into your experience with Rogers and inverted fullbacks. Was the players that he had doing that were they suitable? Did they improve? Did he stick with it? And and, and how successful was it? Yeah, so it was it was very successful while we were using it. It was derailed because of injuries, and that will kind of yeah. answer the second part or one of the parts of your question about in terms of the profile of player he wanted to use in that role. And he had very specific case studies he wanted to use. We had James Justin and Ricardo Pereira, who James Justin can play left back, right back and centre back. And he is comfortable enough playing all those positions that inverting him into the centre of the pitch, because he can play both fullback positions, he's adequate with both feet. And I think that's a kind of a key part of an inverted fullback is that you're going to receive the ball and have to do actions on both feet. Whereas if you play your traditional role as a left back, you'll be doing majority of your actions on the left foot. And so you don't necessarily need to be as gifted with your right. You can kind of get away with it. And so the players that he targeted to play in that inverted role was was Justin and then also Ricardo Pereira, who Ricardo Pereira is probably the best ball carrying player we have in our entire team in terms of bringing the ball through the thirds, can dribble past players. He hasn't been anywhere near his best in recent times. Again, that's down to injuries and he has reoccurring issues that are muscle related. But he was used because he had that ability to receive the ball, could pivot as soon as he received it 180 degrees and just carry it through the pitch. And so when those two players got injured and you then you're looking across, well, who's playing fullback for us? And it was, you know, you speak about Taylor there. Well, we've got Timothy Castagna, who is a higher profile version of this, but is quite limited in terms of technique. And, and he is just a, a workhorse and will get up and down that that flank for you and was brilliant at Atalanta before he joined us as a wing back. But that was in Gasparini's system. That was a case of, You've just got to be an option and wide and just keep running up and down for us and support both the attack and defensive side of the game for us. And so Castagna is quite limited in terms of receiving the ball and, and having that technical ability to maybe create something from a central portion of the pitch. And so Rogers was like, we're not using inverted fullbacks with the profile of players we've got. So I think, you know, as much as there's 
a reluctance to try and shoehorn players into profiles. I think that is actually the correct thing to do. You shouldn't just go for an approach because you want to use that approach. You should have the right profiles to do so. And I think that maybe is a part of Rogers's kind of managerial growth is that I feel like at parts he's shown stubbornness throughout his career that like, this is my approach and I'm going to go with it irrespective of how successful it's going. And to a level, that's what you need. You need to have that self-belief to get himself into the position he's got himself into, which is being a very successful manager at a multitude of big clubs. But kind of understanding that, no, this approach won't work with the personnel I've got, so I'm not going to go for it, I think is also him adapting and learning within himself that maybe I can try a different approach. And so I'd be interested to see, obviously your players have had a chance to use that in, under Postacoglu, so maybe they'll feel a little bit more suited to it and so Rogers can come in and, and continue to use it. But in terms of with Leicester City, we didn't really get to develop it a whole lot because the season started and the two key players in those inverted roles picked up injuries and it was it was a shame because I'd spent a lot of time analysing it and so the whole fan base were trying to understand an inverted fullback what is this role and I'd spent so many hours like this is what it does this is how it works and everyone was like this is fantastic Dom and I'm like yeah I can't wait for you to see it in practice and then first two games of the season major injuries and we're playing traditional fullbacks it's like Dom what were you talking about I'm like I know I don't even know anymore so uh, it was a shame that it never really got to set off the way I wanted yeah. it to. But um, yeah, it was definitely successful in its optimization, uh, And I think that, yeah, it was nice to see that Rogers kind of accepted defeat that the players aren't going to be able to do that role. So we're not going to force it. And so we, we kind of went back to more traditional stuff. Even in that, though, there'd be times where he would ask players to move around. I spoke about Tillemans, who mm. by all accounts is a number six, number eight. But he picked up that right back position so frequently for us towards the end of last season. So not the one that's just finished, the one before that. And that was an idea that I hadn't seen him use before. And I really, really liked that because he was a creative hub that could receive the ball early in a possession sequence because he's deeper in the pitch. And he didn't have those responsibilities to kind of track once there was a turnover of possession, that the body that was in the midfield had more legs. It'd be a fullback that moved inside. And so I really liked that idea that he'd gone for. And I think that really elevated Tillemans' game under Leicester City. He became such an influential player for us in both sides of the pitch, really. And that was in part due to the idea of an inverted, inverted fullback. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, thank you. That makes sense. So just, just, I mean, the final one for me really um, is, is on the subject of kind of pressing and pressing strategies. Mm. Um, but before I get that, I just touch on something you said earlier, which is really interesting about how you felt that Rogers, you know, when you had a lead in the game, you'd sometimes become a little bit more defensive and then, you know, try and sort of shore things up rather than be true to. So we, we've, we've, in the last two years, we've had all, we've had the exact opposite of that. We've had a coach who will not take a, a step back and will play the same way regardless of the match situation and the opposition. So, um, and where that manifests itself in, especially is in pressing strategies. So um, domestically, you know, Celtic can get anywhere between 65 to 75% possession. So mm. with that, that huge amount of possession, you can be very aggressive with the press when you don't mm. have the ball. You're, 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 you're without the ball for a very short period of time. Yeah. Um, and you're generally pressing onto a team that's quite, quite low, quite com compact and in their own defensive third. So it can be, it can be very effective. When you play Real Madrid in the Bernabeu and you try and play exactly the same way and you've only got 40% of the ball, it hits a little bit different. And, and in the game, the game at Celtic Park when we played them, we kind of made them uncomfortable for about half an hour. I think they looked a bit annoyed and slightly irritated, but then they just basically kept the ball for... Bit seventy minutes, then picked us off at the end. So be careful what you wish for. I guess I'll, I'll say, tell you on that one. But so joking aside, just what just wanted to to touch on, um, you know, how Rogers' pressing strategies evolved over the period that he was there. You know what you felt he did effectively, what you didn't do effectively, because what he's going to inherit um, are a couple of players, well, actually three, probably three players. One of whom I would say is is elite in the world game at pressing which is a Japanese player called Daisan Maeda. You mm, might have heard yeah. of he's, he's not the most yeah, technically yeah. gifted player, um, but he's incredibly fast and he presses with figures like, you know, they're just off the scale compared to his peer group. Um, the centre forward, Kyogo, similarly, never gives anybody a second. And Matt O'Reilly, who, who's quite a big player, um, but he's not particularly fast, but, but he's incredibly intelligent and he positions himself well. He doesn't press by thrashing into people he presses by getting a foot in and positioning himself well so there's there's, there's, some, there's something to work with there but I just wondered you know what were your experiences again how coherent was Roger's pressing strategies how did it evolve over the period that it was there 
Yeah, I, I've always been a fan of Rodgers' pressing systems. I think if you were to characterise it over his entire tenure at the club, I'd say it's more of a high block into a press. So not necessarily high pressing relentlessly because, you, you know, we're, as a club, we're going to struggle to hold the ball for you know longer than 55% possession, for example, because we, we were still a ball playing team. And so we would like to control the game and, and keep possession. But sometimes you've just got to accept that other teams are good at keeping the ball as well. And so we'd more operate in a mid to high block and then we'd press out of that. And against the top teams, when we knew we were going to be conceding possession, and I talked earlier about that kind of inferiority complex that Rogers struggled with, we would use pressing triggers and we'd play traps and, and stuff like that. And we were quite detailed and creative in terms of how we'd use them. You know, shepherd a team to one side of the pitch, force them to make a pass inside that they don't want to. And then you, you press and you squeeze the pitch and stuff like that. And so I've always felt that Rogers' understanding of how to position the team off the ball has been very good to a very good level. I, I like the way that we, we utilise that. I think that it's difficult because Les City have been, we, we won the Premier League being a counter-attacking team. So we were so transition heavy, we'd win the ball back and it'd be two passes and Vardy be through on goal. And so some of our fans yearn for that style of football and that's just not how it works anymore. I think if people were to point out maybe one slight issue maybe with Rogers' pressing system was that when we won the ball back, it was kind of how direct you'd be afterwards and we wouldn't be quite direct. We'd, we'd win the ball back, even in a high turnover, and it'd be like, well, we want to control the ball again now. So we kind of recycle it back into the defensive third and try and characterise and build a, a sequence kind of off the training ground, try and get it back into a, a context that you're used to rather than just a high turnover and the fluidity of where players are positioned out of, out of, out of position and, and stuff like that. But I think that there's always been like a good pressing intensity. And as I say, players that Rogers favoured in terms of his 11 were players that could run. You know, one really interesting part actually is that when he inherited Leicester, and he took over, Vardy was a relentless presser of the ball. He would push every single defender to maximum for 90 minutes of a game, maybe 75 and get pulled off if he was really, really going for it. And when Rodgers came in, the first piece of advice he gave to Vardy and said that you're going to have to do in my system is you can't leave the width of the goalposts. You're not allowed to go wider than that part of the pitch. I want you central so that when we win the ball back, you're in a position where we can find you and you can find the back of the net because you are our goal threat. And you've seen in recent years that when Vardy hasn't been as successful in front of goal, Leicester City haven't been as successful because he's been such an integral part of how we've played over these these years, including during Rodgers' tenure. Despite Vardy not really being the profile of forward, I think Rodgers actually wanted towards the end. I think he wanted a bit more of a connective forward that could bring those players around him into the game. Vardy's a last touch forward. He doesn't get involved in build-up and he will just put the last touch and put it into the back of the net for you. But it's really interesting to see that transition of a player that would be willing to press the fullback just run relentlessly to them being a player that would actually was more instructing players. He'd be pointing, saying, you pick him up, you pick him up. And he'd stay very central. And that was a massive tweak that was part of the press that play, the, the, the club, sorry, and the fans hadn't seen before. And that was a major part of Rogers's kind of identity was don't let Vardy stretch further than that and let the other players kind of squeeze the pitch around that. But I think that for the most part, the, the out of possession stuff was, was really, really good from Rogers. It's a part of his game that I do think is, is, to an elite level. I think he's got a few attributes that are to an elite, level, an elite level and that would be one of them for me. Uh, I just think that because we struggled so much defensively this season, people are kind of painting it as a different picture to what it is. I think for the most part, our out of possession pressing stuff was to a very good standard and I think that will continue to be the case for, for you guys. As you say, when you have so much control of the ball, it's so much easier to just counter press or put on a high press versus when you're playing in games where it's more of a 50-50 split. But even within that, Rodgers was smart enough to kind of adjust the system to make it so that we could still be influential at our possession. Perfect. Well, this has been tremendous, Dom. You've been uh, more than generous with your time. Um, yeah, that's very kind of you. It's, it's refreshing to have an actual professional on, someone who's doing this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, we're, we're rank amateurs and want to be hobbyists. So you, you, you've uh, graced us with your presence, and we sincerely appreciate that. Um, real quick again, you're, you're, you're on uh, Twitter at uh, – say, say your handle again, if you can remind well, us. First and foremost, you're doing yourself both a disservice by saying amateurish, by the way. I'm not, I'm not having that for a second. Um, <laughs> the, the, tw the Twitter handle is at Dominic Wells underscore SJ. Um, and yeah, that's where you'll find most of my stuff. I don't, I don't want to claim to be professional at it, but I'm hopeful that it can materialise into some form of a professional job for me. And that's kind of the 
the Anglam trying to go down, but we'll, we'll see what happens over the coming years. But it's exciting times, and yeah, just thank you for, for inviting me. And I'm glad I could share some insight. I hope I've been able to answer the questions to, to what you guys are wanting. And I hope, like a lot of less fans don't do this, but I hope he's successful again at Celtic because I think that he is a, a good manager and, and I think that he will get the best out of you guys again like he did previously. Well, we, we certainly wish you luck on your career endeavors and uh, hopefully Leicester gets uh, right back up out of the championship um, now that you're the city group farm system that we thought we were going to become. Uh, so <laughs> good, good luck with Enzo Moresco and we, we hope it turns out well for you. And um, thank you. En enjoy the upcoming season. Yeah, you too, guys. You too. Take care. Thanks. Thank you.